I'm a journalist with ABC News in Canberra. I actually began my career 14 years ago as an ABC rural reporter after studying agricultural science and training as an agronomist, so it's of a particular interest tonight for me. I'm both delighted and really honoured to welcome you to the Canberra premiere screening of the film Food Evolution. I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. We're here this evening due to the work of three Spanish-born plant scientists and science communicators. They've worked in Canberra for more than a decade and they're concerned about the stigma surrounding genetically modified organisms. They say public opposition is delaying their field research, the legalisation and commercialisation of genetically modified plants. And in February, the trio created GMO Only, the initiative hosting this event. I'd like to welcome to the stage one of the initiative's Canberra founders, science communicator, graphic designer and 3D animator, Dr. Marina Trigueros. Please welcome her to the stage. So hello, thank you everybody for coming to this event. So as Adrian said, my name is uh, Marina Trigueros and I'm from GMO Only. GMO Only is an initiative that we started um, early this year with the idea of promoting the benefits of genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say thank you to all the sponsors and collaborators that we have here, because without them, it couldn't have been possible to have tonight uh, this movie. And also, I would like to have a special thanks to Natalia Weidman from the Center of Excellence in Translational Photosynthesis, and Brett Jeets, that is over there, from the ANU Film Group, because they have been uh, heavily involved in the organization of, of this event. So uh, before we watch the movie, we would like to have a feeling about what the audience thinks about genetically modified food. So that's why you've been given three papers, different colors. So please raise your green ones if you want to say yes to genetically modified food red if not, and yellow if you are undecided. So we will repeat, <laughs> we will repeat this after the movie and the Q&A and to see if we have changed your minds <laughs> or not. Ah, okay, yes. So, yes or no? So, yes is green, no is red, yellow undecided. Okay, a lot of undecided, that's good, yes, because maybe we are able to change some minds after the movie, maybe not. So, <laughs> take some pictures. Okay, so I think we are almost ready, but before uh, starting the movie, I would like to say that this is an educational uh, event, so please do not uh, disturb the, the movie. And if you have some questions or something against the GMOs, please wait until the Q&A and express your feelings. And yeah, that's it. I think we are ready to start. Thank you to Dr. Marina Trigueros, and she'll be returning later this evening to take another audience vote at the conclusion. The film Food Evolution will begin shortly. It runs for around one and a half hours, so get comfy. Can everyone now please pull out their phone and just check that it's on silent or switched off? The toilets are located in the foyer, and in case of an emergency, the exits for the theatre are behind you or behind me out in the foyer. And the screening's going to be followed by a Q&A featuring the American director of the film, who will be joining us via Skype. We've also got an expert panel featuring an ANU research scientist, a science journalist and publisher, an international agricultural aid expert, and a representative from the nation's peak farming lobby group. Most of all, though, we really want to in, uh, encourage your questions to the director and the panel after the film. So have your questions ready. For now, please enjoy the film. I'd like to invite Colin Bettles from the National Rural Press Club to the stage to share a few words. Colin? There he is. Hi, thank you. First of all, I'd just like to congratulate the people who put that um, movie together. I really enjoyed that. 
and uh, there was a yeah recognised quite a few people in that um, in the production over the period, having written about GMs for a long period of time and. Coming to journalism from the world of cricket, I didn't really know much about what was going on. But uh, after a while, you sort of have to check the facts and you have to follow uh, the truth. And after a while, some things become more apparent than others. But uh, Chuck Benbrook, I'm still waiting for a return phone call from Chuck Benbrook. Actually featured an email in that movie that uh, where he was actually offered $100,000 to ramrod some research to present as evidence in the Marsh-Baxter trial in Western Australia, if anyone's familiar with that, that was the first uh, test case uh, for property rights around GMs in Western Australia. So um, he was exposed through that FOI chain and someone was lucky enough to know which journalist in Australia to send it to to write the story. But uh, anyway, I'm the president of the National Rural Press Club and we're proud to be uh, supporting this event here. We're a new organisation that set up uh, about a year ago. Uh, and we're getting up on our feet and off and running. We launched in March and we're hoping to have a, a big, or aiming to have a big speaking event coming up in the near future. Open to new members. If anyone wants to part with any money, you're welcome to check us out on the internet and join up as a member. Uh, but our main aim is to uh, merge or work in with our umbrella organisations in each state. We have uh, rural press clubs throughout Australia and we set one up in Canberra because we want to achieve the same sort of goals and uh, I guess some of the communication or examples of communication that we saw in this movie are the similar principles that we share. Uh, we're run by volunteer committees but we're always open to opportunities to partner uh, with events like this and uh, I won't go anymore but uh, thanks for taking the time and uh, congratulations to the organisers and especially to the makers of that film. Thank you. Okay, I think our Skype link's coming up soon. Um, while that's happening, let me tell you a little bit more about our speakers today. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Finkel, two from the end, editor-in-chief of Cosmos magazine. Ella originally trained as a biochemist before becoming a science journalist, and her work has appeared on ABC Radio's Science Show, The Age, and the US Journal Science. She's one of the founders of uh, Cosmos magazine, a print quarterly founded in 2004. And Cosmos also produces a daily online digital edition, a daily and weekly e-newsletter, and a year seven to 10 education resource as well. Ella won the Eureka Science Prize, uh, prize for science journalism two years ago with one of her long form print articles, A Stat in a Day. She's also the author of Stem Cells, Controversy on the Frontiers of Science and the Genome Generation. Professor Robert Furbank, next to me right here, Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis at ANU. Bob's been working with rice and wheat for the last decade to improve photosynthesis and crop yield using techniques including genetic manipulation. His research is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and he's also working closely with the Grains Research uh, and Development Corporation. He was awarded the CSIRO Plant Industry Leadership Award in 2014, and he's been based at ANU since then. In his spare time, Bob also grows wine grapes in the capital region. Professor Andrew Campbell, next to him in the blue, um, who was appointed as the CEO of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research last year. ACR's Australia's oldest agricultural aid program, and it funds projects in developing countries which help reduce poverty and improve food security. Andrew has worked in natural resource management roles and research leadership for three decades. He was the nation's first national land care facilitator. He's a visiting fellow at ANU's Fenner School, and in his spare time, he remains involved in his family farm in Western Victoria. And finally to Tony Maha, right down the end, who was appointed Chief Executive of the National Farmers Federation in March last year. Prior to that, Tony worked in the leadership team with the NFF, Australia's peak agriculture lobby group for five years. He worked previously with the Australian Food and Grocery Council and the Department of Agri Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. He completed his masters here at the ANU. And in his spare time, he's involved with a family mixed farm near Ballarat in Victoria. And finally, to the Food Evolution Director, Scott Hamilton Kennedy. Is he on the Skype link with us? Not yet, but we'll come back to uh, our Skype link. We might be having just a few little technical difficulties. What we might do while that one is coming along is I really wanted to throw to the panel members to briefly comment, obviously, on the key issues raised in the film and their relevance to Australia, our Pacific region, and, of course, your own work. If you can all please start by introducing yourself once again. Perhaps Tony? Yeah, sure. Thank you. 
Um, so, Tony Marr, Chief Executive of the National Farmers Federation. We're the, the body that represents farmers right across Australia from, from all the states and all of the commodities. Um, so obviously uh, we're, we develop and, and try and get the right policy that, uh, that drives profitability and productivity of farmers in Australia. Um, GM is one of the issues that we uh, have, a, have a keen interest in, obviously, representing farmers. Um, and my take on, on the film, on, my, on the movie, I suppose, was um, the complexity and uh, the, the need for solid evidence and data in, in this discussion. The way that we develop policy internally in our organisation really relies on heavily on evidence and data and that, and that um, builds our credibility and integrity. And, and for me, um, the, the way that this uh, movie was, was balanced and, and relied on and um, in some ways for me uh, balanced up the argument around GM was really refreshing and, and really positive. I've got to say when I first got the invitation to look at the movie I was thinking here was another bake for the agriculture industry and um, my job is to stand up for the farmers of Australia so I was um, expecting something a little bit different but I was uh, pleasantly surprised in, in terms of um, having an, an informed discussion around this issue. Ella, would you like to add? Um, well, I'm Elizabeth Finkel, editor of Cosmos magazine. I thought it was a wonderful movie. It's my second viewing. Um, I was very familiar with the issues and the actors, but I loved the, the filmic uh, treatment of the subject, the way it went into the characters and went into the backstories, and really gave you the time to really explore the dimensions of this argument. Um, I've, I've uh, written quite a bit about the issue. I'm a former research scientist who became a journalist and took my skills as a researcher into journalism and I've always thought, wow, well that was easy. It's, you know, if you are a reporter you should do your research, you should know how to interview people and evaluate data. So I've taken across a skill set um, I view my duty to the public and I've looked intently for evidence of harms from genetically modified food and uh, have yet to find them. So. Andrew? Thanks Adrienne. Yes, um, as your introduction said, ACR is a, an independent um, agency here in Canberra as part of the Foreign Affairs Portfolio. And we've been around since 1982 trying to improve food security and, and uh, livelihoods of smallholder farmers in particular in the Indo-Pacific region, um, predominantly by putting Australian agricultural science in partnership with, part, with uh, scientists from those developing countries um, to improve food security but also to improve natural resource management. Um, and the GM technologies are a really important tool in the toolkit. Uh, but they're not a magic bullet and, and uh, quite often trying to improve food security means you have to work on the whole system, not, not just uh, one particular fix. Bob? This um, uh, topic, I guess, is pretty dear to my heart. I've spent 30 years working in CSIRO on um, crop improvement. Um, since about the late 1990s, I've been using um, transgenic technologies mostly in plants, slow to, um, uh, to test out um, hypotheses on how plants function, how they work and how we might improve them. Um, more recently, uh, the role I'm in now, uh, the centre I lead, is all about food security. It's about improving uh, crop performance by improving photosynthesis, the efficiency with which plants harvest light and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And it's kind of a new breeding frontier. So in that, uh, this centre, um, uh, half of the centre's projects have a delivery mechanism which involves uh, GM technologies and the other half is more about traditional breeding uh, and bringing those two things together. Um, I guess my view has always been that um, uh, GM technology is another breeding tool um, and uh, so I'm, I guess it's preaching to the converted a little bit to, uh, uh, to watch this film. But, uh, for me, the film was more about um, using solving method and evidence-based reasoning to come to important decisions in your life um, on food safety and, uh, uh, and what you should feed your kids. So uh, it really, for me, um, uh, brought home how important STEM education is in schools and how it is important for us uh, as scientists to, to try and spread the word on, on how to think 
um, and how to make decisions. And uh, no, so that's why I was impressed by the message um, uh, from the film. Okay, and finally I'd like to welcome Food Evolution Director Scott Hamilton Kennedy who's joining us via Skype link. Greetings. The Los Angeles based writer, director, producer, cameraman and editor has worked on documentary, scripted films, music videos, commercials, motion capture animation, scripted and reality television. He's an Academy Award nominee and also an Oscar nominee. Um, Scott, if you'd like to maybe begin by, you know, who funded the, the film? Oh, let's get right to it. <laughs> good, good morning and thank you for having me. I just want to let you know that my, my chemical of choice this morning is tap water from Washington, D.C., so <laughs> you can determine the risk assessment on that. But, uh, <laughs> mm. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, the film was funded by the uh, uh, Institute of Food Technologists, IFT. Um, you can hear it, you can read a longer version of the origin of the film on our website, foodevolutionmovie.com. So IFT wanted to make a film to celebrate their 75th anniversary. They're a group of, it's a nonprofit organization, a group of, of food scientists from around the world, about 18,000 of them. And they came to a, a filmmakers like myself to try and ask them, uh, is there a documentary in looking at the 9 billion 2050 conundrum, right? That the population is going like this especially in, in developing countries, that we're going to need to feed uh, screaming from 7.7 .7 billion to, to 9 billion by 2050, and how are we going to feed all those people safely and sustainably? That was too big of a subject for, for a film, but uh, we went away and we researched, myself and my producing partner, Tracy, and went away and researched, and the GMO story was just waving its hand, saying that this is a timely story. It is a story about science, it's a story about food, it's both has elements of both first and third world, and most excitingly for me as a storyteller, it was very controversial and wasn't being told correctly. Um, but most importantly about the funding with a room full of scientists is, is that, well, with anyone, was that I demanded very early if they wanted to continue talking to me that, that I, want, I had to have complete creative control and final cut like a good scientific experiment and the funder is there were no promises requested and there was there and i pro there were no results requested and there was no results promised and that's extremely important because there's perceived conflict of interest and then there's true conflict of interest so could some say that some of the scientists at ift work for big food and industry that absolutely can happen and i've been accused of that we can talk, continue to have that conversation, but uh, I had completely creative control, so we like to say if you have a problem with the film, <laughs> it goes here. What's been the most surprising reaction to the film screenings you've had to date? Sure. Is this an adult crowd? Do I, do I get to use adult Oh, I language? think so. <laughs> Mostly? Okay. Uh, the term we've come to use is uh, confirmation bias is a bitch, <laughs> to be blunt, uh, that the extent of people's uh, confirmation bias and seeing the world the way that they want to see it, seeing it within our bubbles, as, we, as we've come to say uh, in this day and age. Um, it's just so strong, and I, I, I learned about confirmation bias in the making of the film, and it was very exciting to look at my own confirmation bias and, and really see it in others, but it's amazing how you can present someone with uh, facts don't persuade, as they say. You can present somebody with uh, evidence that goes counter to their worldview, and even if it's supported by, as we know at GM, uh, thousands of scientific organizations, that doesn't mean that they're, they will change their mind. But at the same time, we have seen the film help uh, change minds, so it's, it's been a great honor. Before we open it up to audience questions, because we really want your questions, I'd just like to ask if any of the panel have any questions of the director that they'd like to get in first. Oh, I, I have one. I mean, of, of all the actors here, uh, one of the most confounding to me has been Greenpeace, um, mm. because a, a lot of the protagonists in the debate, they don't have scientific knowledge, but Greenpeace is a huge organisation. They, they have scientifically trained people. They know how to uh, interrogate scientific information, I think and they hold an enormous position of public trust. And there are things that make no sense at all. For instance, <laughs> uh, with uh, BT cotton, it has halved the use of really bad pesticides. 
Um, isn't that what Greenpeace is about? Um, it has stopped millions of uh, Indian farmers from pesticide poisonings. So how do you explain that? Because that's one thing I've never been able to get my mind around. Uh, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent question and a very frustrating one. And I hope you all saw at the, at the end of the film, Rich Roberts, the Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist, started his amazing campaign that's now up to 125 Nobel uh, laureates asking Greenpeace to stop spreading fear on GMOs. And it's very important that he, they didn't say, shut Greenpeace down. I think that's very important to that the respect that was there and the nuance that was there. Because it's not saying that, that we shouldn't have organizations that are being skeptical of situations. We shouldn't have organizations that are looking out for, for the environment. But if they get it wrong, they need to be called out, just like we would call anybody out. So the why of it is very difficult. They didn't. Um, uh, we, we, we asked to have uh, interviews with them, and, and they turned us down um, once they heard that we had any sort of pro-GMO stance um, on the film. Um, and it's hard to, to not point to the fact that, the, that they get funding by, you know, sort of feeding this kind of fear to people that have given them money for a long time. And it's really a shame, because I wish they'd take that energy and put it towards you know, more correct uh, concerns. Um, and, and maybe they will. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. But, you know, I have had people call from, I would call it Greenpeace's side of the argument, call the film propaganda, many of them calling it propaganda without having seen the film. And if that's not an obvious fail, I don't know it is. And I've asked to have public debates with them saying, OK, you're calling me a propagandist. Let's have a debate. Where uh, you're calling me a propagandist, and I'm calling you an ideologue. Let's see who wins. And I feel pretty confident how I would do in that debate. OK. Has anybody got any burning questions that they'd like to put to the director or the panel before we continue the discussion? Great. We've got a question in the middle there. Can we get the roving mic over? Do, sorry, can I have a tiny, tiny request? Is of course. Way, is there any way somebody can get closer to the camera so that I can see them when they ask the question, or is that hard? If it oh, can't, yeah. <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll try. Now, are we able to get that microphone to the gentleman in the red shirt? <coughs> We're just getting a, a question from the audience, Scott. Sure. And if you can start by, um, if you're comfortable, your name, any background that's relevant. Uh, David Salt. I'm at ANU. I'm a science writer. Um, I thought it was a fantastic movie. but. Um, I also thought it kind of glossed over uh, scientific determinism, that science gives us the answers. And at the beginning of the movie, someone made the comment that the Hawaiian Council made the wrong decision because it was against what the scientists felt was the right decision. And I thought that glossed over the fact that maybe the Hawaiian Council decision was naive, maybe it was a bit ignorant, but it was a decision, a democratic decision being made by this council who was trying to listen to the evidence. They didn't maybe weigh it up in the right way, but, but it was still, I think, a valid and, and a, a decision, the decision process that could be defended. And I think that a lot of what was presented in the movie was, was a form of scientific determinism, and that a lot of the response against GMOs is the fact that too often we've been told by science this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do, and it's turned out that it's not been as the scientists have said. One guy even said in, in the movie that uh, GMOs is, is kind of a metaphor for how people respond to land use and agriculture, and I thought that was a fantastic comment. So I suppose my question or my point to you and, and the panel is, is do you think that scientific determinism should be maybe questioned a bit more? That even though the scientists might have a process which is robust and strong, that what the people feel and the way they make decisions needs to be maybe honoured a bit more? That's, no, that's, that's fair enough. I'll, I'll go first and panelists can chime in. Um, that uh, I can give the um, I've come to use the term, you know, the limitations of well-intended individuals, right? So in, in Hawaii, forgive me, there's a train going behind me, and I can't tell how loud that is. So um, the, the, the fact that some had good intention on that, on that council is, is, is fair enough. But let's talk more importantly to the scientific determinism. Um, 
if Neil deGrasse Tyson, Eric, puts it like this, if you are skeptical of, of science, you're skeptical of, of GE, that's a good thing to do. But if you're presented with overwhelming consensus on the science, repeat, repeatability, hundreds and thousands of studies being done, then if you and keep denying it, you deny, deny those results, you're not a skeptic anymore, you're a denialist. And those, that really is what I saw in Hawaii. The people that they chose to be their experts were flawed. The people that they chose not to listen to were, were better. So um, that would be mine. But of course, be skeptical. Of course, we've seen um, science have one determination, obviously the most horrific one, C cigarettes in, in, in a way. Um, but let's not take that cynicism about one mistake on science and, science and say we can't listen to any of it. Okay, has anybody else got a, a question for, oh, we've got two, right. One, right. one right at the back, lady right at the back. Yes, um, in the late 60s or early 70s when I was at university, the Green Revolution was projected as saving the world. It was very positive and negatives came in later to a certain degree. Part of it is that I felt the movie was concentrating a lot on the safety aspect. What about some of the affordability for small farmers to afford the seed? Does this mean that agriculture is becoming, um, as, it, as the trend is there anyway around the world, uh, in industry of larger farmers. Um, the other aspect that uh, I was wondering about is the restriction of this uh, gene pool um, is very important in this issue as well. So I, I, I think the movie looked at certain aspects, but perhaps it could also have been broader. Are you able to just restate your question there? Sorry, madam, would you be able to just restate your question a bit more loudly? Oh, um, what part? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to put a question specifically to the director? Sorry, I'm having a few technical problems there. There we go. Uh, um, would you be able to just restate your question to the director? Yes, uh, part of it was that the Green Revolution, when I was at university, was, was a saviour of the world. And some of the aspects that were considered very positive were then presented, uh, perhaps in um, rethink to some degree. And I wonder if the uh, GM aspects will sort of, to a certain degree, undergo the same um, why? And it, it, it the, the movie really looked at the safety of GM food only, not so much the affordability. I know Africa was presented, but going back to the um, origins of the Green Revolution, it was very often an argument of affordability for um, the farming community in underdeveloped countries, in poorer countries. And what I'm saying is, does this, in a way, um, involve consolidation of farming? Sure. S Scott, would and you care to comment? And the gene pool aspect as well, I was wondering about. Scott? Um, I think I could take the second half, if I, if I could try uh, start with that. So uh, the film has definitely been ac uh, accused by some as saying it was all about um, safety and it didn't deal with other deal with other issues. So, so two pieces. One, safety was the biggest issue that was scaring people into how they determined if they're going to use or avoid uh, GM technology, as we saw in um, in places like in places like Hawaii. So that, uh, and what I would say to the critics about um, saying I left. I didn't deal with other things. I think if we actually went back and watched the film, there are other nuances nuances in there. But more importantly, most of the things that you're voicing concern with are completely valid. But if we remove GM from the conversation, they would still be there. So let's take it case by case and look at those individually and not tie them 
uh, conflate them with, with GM. Um, and, uh, and the other aspect, I, don't, I might have to hear your, your question again, or, or the question could go to the rest of the panel. I can. I just wanted to go back to Andrew Campbell, who had a comment, I apologise for missing before, to the previous question. Thanks, Adrian. Um, responding to David, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right, David. Um, the, the comments uh, of Nathaniel, Nathaniel Johnson that uh, it's really about how people see their relationship to food uh, are, are really important. And uh, this is going to become even more important in a post-truth world. Uh, it should have been obvious already that the facts uh, alone are not enough and that you need to understand the broader social and cultural and political context in which those facts are going to land. And, um, and that's something where I think the, we need to be very conscious of, of the risks of scientific determinism and of just looking at things through a single disciplinary lens. And so I think if the proponents of this particular suite of technologies had worked more with social scientists and ecologists and science communicators from the early days, and I think uh, the, the fellow from Monsanto said as much, we might be in a different place today uh, around trust. And so uh, leaving aside the ownership of the IP and concerns about corporations and so on, I think there's still a fundamental one there about the way in which we do try and land uh, new technologies that potentially challenge people's values about how they see their relationship to land and food. Mm. So um, I, I think you make a very important point. Ella? Uh, if I could make a riposte there. Um, you're accusing science of a determinism, but the anti-GMO <laughs> movement has an, a much greater sense of determinism in that they would, they and they have effectively prevented farmers accessing GM technology in many parts of the world, reaching all the way to Africa. And no scientists are suggesting that any organic farmer stop farming any way they want to. And it strikes me this is, this goes to a sense of an issue of justice and uh, I'm no farmer, I, I only know about agriculture from talking to people like Rob and, and others, but what I have learned about farmers is that each farmer is their own scientist. They're fiercely independent, they know their little patch of territory, and they want to do it their way. Now, why should Greenpeace be telling a farmer how they are allowed to farm? Give them all the tools. Let, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. And Tony? I was just going to try and comment um, and answer the question up there around I, what I took what was um, is, is agriculture becoming more consolidated and more um, and larger uh, on larger scale and I think there's a whole range of factors that are driving um, consolidation in agriculture um, if we're going to um, respond to some of the pressures that we saw outlined in, in the movie but also the, the, that we know the 9 billion people by 2050 sort of um, aspect or, or fact that, that's out there. I mean, in Australia, around 99% of the farms are still family owned and, and still, you know, medium medium to small size. Um, there is consolidation absolutely happening because of those economic pressures. And I, I would argue that the film, for me, picked up, you know, some of the social and environmental issues that GM um, technology can help respond to. And, and it's absolutely important from an economic and an environmental perspective that we do have um, all of the tools available to Australian farmers and global farmers to help respond to these things because um, it is getting harder and harder to be a farmer and to respond to all of the pressures that the community um, is, is wanting and, and expecting. Um, technology like GM just has to be part of, uh, of the solution. Well, if we bring Bob in, when I was preparing for this, it reminded me that six years ago in 2011 here in Canberra, you may recall women wielding whippersnippers destroyed wheat being grown as part of a CSIRO GM trial at Ginandera, and those two women were Greenpeace volunteers. Um, Bob, I understand some of your UK colleagues' GM crop trials have since been raided by 
protesters not once but twice. So I wondered, is public opposition to GMs and protest activity like this significantly thwarting your research and also increasing the cost to register GM crops here in Australia? Yes, it certainly is. Um, what was interesting about the um, uh, Greenpeace activities in Australia, I guess, was um, a complete um, misunderstanding of, of how much public support uh, Greenpeace would have for that um, uh, act on the CSIRO trials. There was an assumption that there'd be a huge amount of public opinion supporting um, uh, these acts, um, uh, but in fact they were generally viewed as some kind of eco-vandalism and to the point where uh, people were phoning up the TV station saying, oh, I recognise some of those people, they live down the road and dobbing them in. So I thought that was a fairly curious situation and quite different to the situation in Europe and in the UK. So there is a, a basic difference, I think, um, between the views that are held more broadly in Australia on GM technologies and those that appear to be held uh, uh, or may be held more broadly in Europe. Um, perhaps it's more of a, a vocal minority, I don't know. Um, but what, is, what we see um, is um, we're, we're quite conservative about um, the approval process for uh, GM technology. Um, I can see that um, uh, food safety, which we saw in this film, is, is paramount for everyone. And we've seen so many issues uh, globally over uh, the last few decades um, uh, uh, of threats to, uh, to providing nutritious, healthy food uh, to the general populace um, that um, the actual quality of the food and the safety of the food is something that's paramount in people's minds. So the registration procedure for a GM crop is quite long and involved and expensive. So the, the amount of, uh, of feeding trials and, um, uh, uh, and tests that are done on a GM product far exceed anything that's done uh, through traditional plant breeding. So one can bring genes in, for instance, from deadly nightshade uh, into tomatoes to increase storage properties. Uh, and then in a few back crosses, it can go out into the, um, uh, the food production system, whereas the equivalent introduction of that trait through GM would have many, many years of feeding trials uh, and cross checks. So I'm not saying that's wrong, that we certainly should protect the um, uh, safety of our food, but um, uh, in terms of bringing these things to market at the moment, um, uh, it's a very long and involved and expensive process. So that even will inhibit our capacity to do research. So um, uh, for instance, the Grains Corporation uh, is not happy to fund uh, GM projects involving wheat because the cost of registration is so high uh, that getting a, a GM wheat crop out there um, uh, is not considered a good investment. So uh, we've got to strike some sort of a happy medium, I think, in terms of um, our risk analysis. And, and this is something that came through in the movie for me too, was to have a basic understanding of statistics and what's an acceptable risk. You know, I won't go outside the house because I might get hit by a meteorite. Or, you know, um, understanding what a, an acceptable risk is is really important for the community to make decisions on, on GM produce. Andrew, do GM crops feature in any of ACR's current work and do we need them to provide food security in our region? Uh, yes, we're funding CSIRO uh, GM work on, uh, on pulses. Uh, and um, as I said, it's an important tool and, and we're likely to continue to invest in it. Uh, but generally within a, uh, within a farming systems context where that bit of science is providing a crucial missing ingredient. Um, Borlaug got a well-deserved Nobel Prize for his work on the Green Revolution. Probably MS Swami Nathan, his Indian partner who provided a lot of the complementary agronomy uh, uh, fertilisers and farming systems work should have got one as well. Um, the, the genetics on their own weren't, weren't going to um, make the difference in saving so many hundreds of millions of lives. Is opposition to GM research in the West suppressing developing countries in our region or are there other more critical issues that you see as part of your work? Um, at the margins but uh, uh, there are certainly bigger, bigger issues. Uh, access to land, access to water, um, um, the role of women, re women's access to resources and decision making. Uh, there are many um, much bigger issues. Certainly there are some particular pests and there may well be a GM fix for that particular pest in that particular place, but that's not 
a very common situation across the board. Uh, but overuse of resources uh, and uh, the broader issues that affect uh, food and production, particularly post-harvest loss, is a, a huge issue. Uh, and we wouldn't actually need to grow 70% more food by 2050 if we didn't waste so much. Uh, in developing countries, it's wasted closer to the farm. Uh, in rich countries, it's wasted in the fridge and beyond. Um, and that's, that's something that we really need to get on top of because of the embedded water, energy, uh, nutrient, and so on. But uh, GM has an important role to play. It's a critical tool in the toolkit, and we'd be silly to throw that tool away. Uh, but equally, we, we'd be, um, it would be a mistake for us to focus just on that and ignore everything else. Who else has got a burning question? Oh, look, we've got so many. OK, where are we going first, ladies? OK, over here to the left. Hi, um, I'm Rowan and I'm a PhD student in, at ANU. Can you speak up again and just, yeah. just a bit louder? Okay. Hi. So I'm Rowan, I'm a PhD student at ANU and my question is about changing public opinion on GMOs. And seeing as GMOs are almost synonymous with Monsanto and the public opinion about Monsanto is so bad, is, would it be wise for the wider scientific community to distance themselves from Monsanto and also to make obvious to the public that an acceptance of GMOs is not necessarily an endorsement of Monsanto. Who would like to comment, Ella? Tony? I can, I, I mean, I'll start. Um, I, I think last week or the week before, um, there was a, some sort of survey, and I can't vouch for its credibility, but it, it was noteworthy for me that uh, farmers were in the top one or two um, professions that were trusted and, um, and had a reputation of, of doing the right thing in the community. So um, in terms of trying to um, balance up the d discussion or influence the consumer's perception of GM, I think industry has got um, a lot of opportunity to, to help um, tell the story on why it makes sense for, for farmers and the, and the agriculture industry to um, have all of the tools, GM included, um, to produce the, the great, um, wonderful food and fibre that, that they produce. So from an industry perspective, I think there's a huge opportunity. Ella, would you care to add? Oh, I agree. I think, I think it's a, a great point. I don't think necessarily distancing yourself and demonising Monsanto, but I think emphasising um, I, I don't think there's a university department anywhere in the world that doesn't have their own GM program. It is the uh, propagandists who continually try to conflate GM with Monsanto to make, to make that particular argument. So I think, I think that would be great, and I, I think it is done, um, but out there on the internet, uh, anything you read about GM is and instantly conflated with Monsanto. Let's try and get to a few more questions. I'm just conscious there's quite a few. Let's head over here to this side. Thanks. Um, I'm Timothy. I'm a first year student at ANU. Um, in the film, the theme of trust was touched upon, and I thought that was something that resonated with me. Basically, I've got two questions. The first one deals with trust, and the second one deals with the um, confirmation bias. So with regards to trust, my question is, how can this trust therefore be repaired um, between the scientific community and the, and the general public? And how can the idea, because I understand that there seems to be an apparent, um, an apparent vested interest, even though this may not be true, but this may be perception the public has. So therefore, how can this reputation be repaired? The second question with regards to communication and, com and confirmation bias is that in my family, for example, my parents are anti-GMO, even though I've explained to them why I personally believe that it's a good thing and why, for some reason in the film, that I believe it's the future forward. Yet at the same time, regardless of how much I talk and regardless of the facts, they still are entrenched in their opinions. So therefore, in knowing that facts don't seem to shift opinions so much, how therefore should we change our approach to scientific communication to best um, convince people and communicate effectively without bashing their heads in and without being patronizing? Great questions, Timothy. Scott, if, if you go first. Oh, hold on a second. Um, 
We might need a little bit of audio assistance. Scott. Sorry, sorry. I oh, was there we go. Muted. Good. I, I was muted. My bad. Sorry, cool. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry everybody. Not, not your technical problem. Uh, uh, I heard most of that question about your parents and confirmation bias and not bashing heads. Um, but could somebody repeat just the, the, the question, just the, the, the core of the question for me? I couldn't hear all of it. The first one was around how to repair trust. Yes. Excellent. So um, very, very difficult. Uh, once you've lost trust, it's very difficult to, 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 to build it back. But um, communicate. Um, empathy. Uh, you, you we're not going to do it with, with, with statistics alone. Um, as I've learned from the wonderful science communicator, Jack Bobo, don't lead with science. You know, lead with a connection. So even with your parents. What are their what are their what are their concerns? And I'm sure they're concerns that all of us have in this this room that they want to have safe, uh, nutritious, God forbid, affordable and sustainable food available. And then let's walk down the road of do you have that available to you? And would GM increase make that better uh, make that better or worse? Um, and in terms of fighting people's confirmation bias. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful book called Thinking Fast and Slow that talks about the two types of thinking that we have. Type one is is, is fight or flight, and you know, call it more cave and instinctual thinking that got us very far uh, to a certain degree. But then type two is more analytical uh, thinking, and that would include getting outside of our bubbles and questioning our our biases. So, um, and also questioning biases of the places we're getting information. So um, we haven't talked about our lovely president, Mr. Trump, but actually his use of things like alternative facts and calling CNN and other places fake news has actually helped me in a way to communicate with some of the people who criticize me because they would be horrified by uh, someone saying those things. They would be horrified by Donald Trump saying fake news, but then I get to go and say, well, wait a minute, you're calling me fake news, so how do we know? And data is what's going to help us determine which one of us is correct. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes more for questions from our panel. Let's get to a few more questions. There's one down the front here, this lady. Hi, I'm Luciana from CSRO. I work in food security. And I was wondering if, uh, to the extent of your knowledge, has anyone uh, quantified what would be the contribution of uh, GMOs to achieve, for example, the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of Zero Hunger for 2030, if there is any study that has been published on that area. Thank you. Andrew, do you have a view? Anybody on the oh, panel? I'm not aware of such a study. Tony? No, I'm not. Scott? No. no. Could you repeat what exact study? Um, so it was around, has anyone quantified um, how GMOs, or whether GMOs could put hunger at zero? Is that a correct reflection of your question? Yeah, has it been quantified? I so in terms the, of food um, security? The only quantification I've seen is around specific traits. So um, uh, you know, lots of graphs have been drawn about crop productivity, for example, in our major cereals, and our annual increases in productivity have dropped below 1%, so there's been lots of modelling of uh, you know, how much we'd have to improve our, our traditional breeding to get to where we need to be by 2050. This is just purely amounts of food. So there's modelling being done there, and um, uh, you know, basically we won't get to where we need to be unless we have some quantum improvements in the way we, we breed. But uh, in terms of the other sustainability goals, I don't think there's anything that, uh, uh, where the direct benefits of GM has been quantified. And Andrew? I agree, but I, I don't know that it's an all that helpful a, a stat. If we look at any agricultural sector, even within Australia, the gap between the best farmers and the average is huge, and the gap between the average farmers and the tail is even bigger. So talking about what you need to do, if you could actually just get the, the average where the best ones are, you, you would be, you'd achieve your goals. And so that comes down to, training, extension, education, resources, and, and so on. And, um, and I think in some sectors, that gap is much smaller than others. And they're the ones that have really got their act together. And then once you've closed that gap, then what technological tools have we got to, to both raise the, the overall performance? And, and that's an important part of that equation. It's not just about a, a techno 
fix. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Ask, Here we go. Could Nan I ask a Nandy. Quick question from the audience? Oh, sorry, Scott. Could sorry. I, sorry. Could I ask a quick question from the audience? It's very fast. But because I'm, I'm looking at all of you, you wonderful people, uh, one of the things we do with the film is we do a poll before and after about concerns about GM, and I won't do the whole thing. But the other question we ask after they finish the film, and it goes to this woman's last question, is how many people, just by a show of hands, how many people in the audience think that the farmers in Africa should have the choice to use GE technology to fix their problem, their food insecurity problem with banana wilt? By a show of hands, how many people think that the farmers have the choice to do it? Is that is that 100%? Or how can that go the other way? Anybody that doesn't, put your hand up. So that's oh, there's a few at the back. I, I'd love to hear why, but but thank you. That's that's uh, uh, thank you for that. Sorry, go ahead. And we are gonna we are gonna take a vote at the end. We just wanted to have a little bit more discussion, so we will get there, Scott. Just quickly, any other questions? I think Mandy had a question at the back there in red. Thanks, Mandy Giles from the National Rural Press Club. Um, just chatting to someone recently about GMOs. They're from the grain industry. What about the I guess, yeah, what about, this might be for Tony, the practicalities of actually dealing with GMO and the um, facilities that we've got for, say, grain, and if you're going to have GMO and non-GMO, huh. how do you handle that? And is that type of thing maybe impacting um, on how much work is being done on GMOs in Australia for some commodities? Yeah, look, I think it's, um, it's an issue. The inconsistency across the country and across um, uh, lesser extent across commodities, but yeah, it is. It's. Um, I mean, Colin referenced the the case before the WA case. Um, it's obviously from an industry point of view, certainty and, and investment certainty is, is critical. Um, and there's going to be ebbs and flows in business cycles, but the uncertainty and the inconsistency across Australia is, um, and the, the supply chain aspects, and then the markets. You know, depending on what markets you're going into, um, is is something that you, that needs to be addressed. And for Scott, um, in case you're not aware, Scott, in Australia, GM crops are banned in South Australia and Tasmania, and there are moratoriums that are going to be reviewed within two years. So, Tony, just an extra question to Mandy's is, you know, is, th is that inconsistency creating contamination issues? Oh, well, it has. I mean, the case uh, in WA has clearly some, someone took a f uh, exception to the fact that their product was included or, or contaminated, so it does. I mean, that's case in point. It, it's an issue. and. and Clearly, I mean, our, our point of view is that then the, we've got to have choice. We've got to have the ability to use these tools to allow us as an industry to grow and, and prosper and be productive. Um, there's a whole lot of strings hanging off that, but the fact um, of having that choice and addressing some of those supply chain issues. Some people in Tasmania, I mean, or other parts of the country, um, utilise and leverage the, the fact that they are GM free, you know, as a market advantage. So we don't want to get in the way of that. We just want to acknowledge and accept that and, and try and respond to those market drivers. Questions. Who else has got one? Here we go in the middle. Can we get a microphone down here? Oh, yep, up the back. Colin, sorry, we will come to you. Um, just um, to the director of, of the film that we just saw, congratulations on a, a fantastic film and for bringing to light some incredible and valuable issues and also for um, showcasing scientists as well as science, uh, science itself. But I'm interested in your use of Mark Linus um, because at the end of the day he's sort of the first whistleblower that we've seen on a grand scale in terms of the intellectual dishonesty that goes on around this issue. And I'm just interested, did you stumble across any other similar types of characters that you could have used in the movie? And also, how far did you consider going down the path of exploiting his reasons for or showcasing his reasons for changing his mind in terms of the hypocrisy he was feeling uh, in terms of the development of his career as an environmentalist and the scientific hypocrisy of opposing GMs while supporting uh, the science of climate change. So, so is the question, did I assess if the Mark Linus's decision to change his mind was worth was lower than his ego to want to be seen as someone who changed their mind? Is that a bit of the question? 
just clarifying now. And I'm not being snarky. No, 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 that's fine. It's my accent. Um, <laughs> the, it's more or less, were there any other characters in the world of GM in terms of whistleblowers, in terms of the intellectual dishonesty that you may have considered using in your production? And also, in your production, how much further consideration did you give to exploring the hypocrisy between uh, those that oppose GM, uh, GMs and ignore the science, but then, as environmentalists uh, like Mark Linus, support the science of climate change, where in fact there's less global consensus than there is on GM amongst the science sure. community. Sure. Well, there's a lot of other people uh, who would call themselves whistleblowers. So I'm not uh, that are that are in the film. So um, and there was lots of other people that we interviewed or, or came in front of the camera that did not end up in the film. As you can understand the process of, of uh, ca calling thousands of hours of footage. Um, so uh, I, I think it goes to you know who do we trust and, and do we honor the fact that somebody actually can change their mind? And I think that's actually one of the greatest things that we can do with this. This, this little mind that we can say, I made a mistake, and how hard that is. I mean, I don't know about traffic situations where you're all living, but how hard it is for somebody that just cuts you off in traffic to go, I'm sorry, right? Because that lowers, you know, that makes them feel vulnerable. So I, I, I have a great deal of respect for, for Mark Linus for, for, for changing his mind, and also his incredible um, intellect and even sense of humor give, gives me as a filmmaker uh, tools to, uh, to entertain us. Um, so I'm not sure if that's answering your question, forgive me. I think it has. And let's get this question from this gentleman in the middle here in the grey jumper. Hello, I'm James. If a farming community recognises the benefit of uh, this process, when it comes to getting the seed, is there going to be a choice at supplier or is it going to be so monopolised by a, co by a company that it's going to be a case of take it or leave it. Is there going to be a choice um, at the top of the pinnacle for people wishing to, to adopt the process? Um, is there going to be any competition? Anyone here on the panel who's got a view on that or some experience in that at Tony? I've got a view. I think there um, absolutely has to be a, a choice. Um, and. Uh, with the consolidation, one of the earlier questions talked about consolidation across the industry and across the supply chain, um, and that has been happening for decades. With the talk about food processing or retailing or, or any of the inputs that go into farmers at the, the uh, farming at the beginning of the supply chain, um, it's it's critical from from a farming perspective um, that there is choice. Um, someone made reference to the to the point about uh, the investment and the, and the time frame required to actually develop this technology. So there's got to be a payback from an industry, a business point of view. There's got to be a payback for those organisations. But we've got to have a level of um, equity and fairness in that in that. Um, in that uh, outcome, but there really has to be a choice. I mean, we don't want, I don't think anyone wants um, a monopoly scenario where there's one company controlling um, agriculture, food and fibre around the world. Got a question at the back here. Hi, just a question to Tony. Um, GM cotton and canola have been grown in Australia now and commercially cultivated for about 20 years or so, uh, side by side with other crops, um, non-GM and organics. I'm just wondering how do South Australian farmers feel about not having the choice to use approved GM crops mm. in, the, um, in comparison to their Victorian neighbours? Yeah, look, uh, what I've found in my time in the agriculture sector is you could line up 100 farmers and there'd be 100 different views on different issues. Um, so I've no doubt that there's farmers in South Australia that are really concerned about um, their inability to, to grow particular products, but there's probably other farmers out there that quite like it and, and you know, utilising that, um, that, that opportunity. So um, I've given up trying to guess um, and try and get a consensus, absolute consensus in the ag sector, um, but I would say coming back to the, the point around having that choice and having those tools available for individual farmers is the real key. So I don't want to dodge the question, but there is, I mean, you line up, whether it's land access or, or anything else, um, farmers will, um, it's the joy of working with them, they've got a whole range of different views. Probably got time for two more questions. Right, lady in the centre with the stripy shirt. Don't know if we can get to everybody, but we'll try. Um, I'm Janet Salisbury, I'm a science writer. Um, the, a lot of the films showed examples of situations where 
there was clearly already a very adversarial, polarized um, thing going on, and including the debate that was shown later on in the film. And, and debates are a classical way of deliberately uh, making a, a, a polarized situation or sort of highlighting a polarized situation from the two different sides. And I just wondered whether during the, your travels in making the film, you actually witnessed uh, situations where a much better type of conversation was happening, where there was a forum where people were really listening to each other. And if so, what were the ingredients for that and how can we do it more? Oh, could you just repeat just the last part? If, if you said, well, if, if you so. saw a situation, if there were situations where there was very good dialogue happening and listening, what were the ingredients for that type of forum to happen, and how can we make that happen more? Well, it's a simple answer. No, no, there's no good dialogue. We're all very mean and selfish people. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, what the, but the best place that I saw that, and we have is this scene on our on our uh, extra scenes on our Facebook page at uh, Food Evo Food Evo Movie. If you can go see this one, it's a really special scene that was in the film for a long, long time, and we had to cut it out just for length. Where there's an agroecological farmer in South Africa having breakfast with a GMO farmer. And they start off being a little bit cagey with each other and who can they trust and, and all that. But as they continue to talk to each other, this actually goes to some of the other questions asked tonight, they hear how similar they are, that they have the same desires to try and grow food and feed their families and pay for the, the rent for their farm. Um, and that they, they actually were using practices that were very similar if it was you know cover crops or rotating, rotating their fields. Um, but the GM farmer did get very specific with the, with the, the agroecologist who, who was against uh, 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 GM, um, saying that shouldn't the farmers have the choice? And he actually made the comparison to uh, HIV medicine that uh, was in Africa and how important that was and how some people were very scared of it at first and there were people dying every day. And they said, give us the choice to use it. And he said, shouldn't farmers have the same choice? So, but it was a very respectful conversation. And um, uh, it, I hope that more of us can, can get to that place, which we are doing tonight. And I would say to everybody on, on the panel, there was a lot of uh, actual, uh, there's a lot of places that we agree or, or both can be correct. We can fear corporate uh, greed and we can use science to determine if GE technology should be used and where it should be used. So life is complicated. It's not, it's not, it's not black and white. So thank you for your question. Final question from the audience. Gentleman in the center in the brown jacket. There's one down the front. Oh, and one down the front, sorry. Quick, quick, quick. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Juan. Uh, I'm a research scientist with CSRO. The question is back to the confirmation bias uh, issue. Um, seems to me that unlike uh, political ideas, uh, in here we have uh, two groups which are pretty much uh, settled with their position, but a big middle ground which is probably more open to receiving new information and mostly those who are not very interested or know that there is a lot of information and, and in general people who uh, don't really understand what we are talking about. And as we saw in the movie, when those people go to an informed debate, a recent debate, more of them turn to uh, turning to accepting the, the technology. However, it may be a biased sample because the general population may not be interested in going to events like this. So the question is really if my perception is true, and if there is a bigger role of um, uh, dissemination or communication of uh, science issues to be played, and, and probably also related to what the, the reception you are having to screenings of the film like this. Scott? Sorry, sorry could you put the, just the, the, the question, what's the specific part, the, the, put the question one more is, time is to it, me? Is, it, is my perception correct that there is a big middle ground of people who want to learn more and yeah. are open to change, but uh, they don't have yeah. the good information? Yes, that, that's been one of the most inspiring uh, elements of the film, and I was introduced, somebody referenced it earlier this evening, I was introduced to the term the, the vocal minority and the silent majority. and. Part of that equation, you could say that there's a lot of people that 
Um, I live in Los Angeles, California, and in a privileged neighborhood of, of wonderful neighborhood of Silver Lake, where there's a lot of people that fear G GM props and uh, think organic food is magically uh, going to send their kids to Harvard. Excuse my sarcasm, um, but uh, but that but that when you start to to talk to them, what they really are hoping for is that they're going to have access to safe and, and nutritious food, and they didn't know a lot about GM, and when. One of our uh, mantras, we little, literally had a post-it in the editing room that said, you know, that GM is a process, not a product, right? That we wanted to separate it from, from Monsanto. And there's these steps that we took in the film to try and, to try and do that. And that's the joy of what you get to do with a 90-minute film instead of a meme, is that you can peel back the onion and, and really dig in on, the, on a situation. And yes, we've absolutely seen it um, changing ch changing people's minds that way. And the yes end of it, though, are you like that that they're they're not changing their mind saying, oh, I was an idiot that I thought GMOs were bad. They changed their mind because they said, oh, GMOs. I didn't know what a GM is, and it actually goes to my worldview more than I thought. And it can do things that I hope uh, we we can add to our agricultural system. Final question down the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Cornish. I'm a journalist. I work for DevEx, and our focus is on the aid and development sector. And I'm really curious as to um, the reason for banning in develop developing countries. Is it the same as in like the US, where it's a health concern, or is it more driven by the economy and concern of fear of loss of markets? And if it's the latter, is there a role that international development, developing development funding, can play to help these countries overcome those barriers? That's an excellent question, and um, it's not it's, it's not one or the other. It's definitely a variety of things. Um, the most important one is that how much influence from developed countries are influencing those developing countries, right? So as you saw in the film, in in Uganda. Emma, you know, has can hear a radio ad like that that's being funded by ActionAid, who's getting their money from Europe and the United States to to to, to have that advertisement, which is just absolute fear mongering. It's horrible, horrible fear mongering. If we could, you imagine if that was recorded in the other way and it said that organic food would, you know, give you horns or something like that, I and mean, it would be shut down. It would be shut down immediately. And I don't mean to make this a polarization between G GMO and organic. It's between some in the organic industry marketing poorly, and that can influence what you're asking about. So how to uh, get better information so that all farmers have access to tools like GM, very, very difficult, but we definitely can call uh, our politicians to the task if they're not using science to make good decisions, and call our, our influencers, be they a celebrity like Gwyneth Paltrow or Greenpeace that is spouting BS, and that trickle effect can go all the way to, as we saw in Africa, to keeping that technology from helping somebody in a food insecure place. And again, let me finish it. Obviously, any of those choices have to be vetted and taken case by case and, and gone through all the safety regulations. So I hope that answers your question. Scott, just one final question. How do you measure the success of your film? So, sorry, say it again? How do you measure the success of your film? Um, well, if I win an Oscar and a Nobel Prize, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> joke, everybody's like, God, this guy's ego. Um, uh, sorry, we did this with Skypes once before where I was on the screen and, and uh, some other people from the film were on the panel like that, and the size difference I, I felt was a very good representation of my ego to their humility. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, it, it's it's happening. The fact that you know I'm I'm in I just did a screening at, at, at the at the Capitol here in D.C. with politicians and, and influencers. I am um, about to go to Europe and screen for the the European Parliament in, uh, in in Belgium and then to the FAO UN in in, in Rome. Um, you know, and I'm sitting here at 5:30 in the morning, DC, talking to you all uh, across the planet. It's amazing. It's, it's just it's just incredible, and uh, and to see that it is changing people's minds. Um, so uh, there's been one of the reasons we made the film was as a parent, 
Uh, there's a lot of this, I feel, right? Making decisions is very hard on how we feed our kids and where we're gonna send them to school, and it gets people very, very tense. And, and things like politicians that say ridiculous things like fake news and, and have their own alternate facts can rightfully make us very tense. And uh, people have said that we're living in a time of chaos or uh, a time of distrust, and I would love to lower that stress because there's stress out there, and there's fear, there's dangers out there. Uh, the question is, do we, can we lower the amount of uh, clarity on the real danger and, and push aside the ones that are a little bit fake and help us make better decisions? So um, thank you for that, that question, but we're, th this, is, this is the success of the film, that, uh, that my, this little film that we made has traveled all, all the way to you all, and, and we're talking about it. So thank you for taking the time. And just quickly, where can other Australians see the film? Will they be able to? Right. Oh, that's a, that's a tougher question currently. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, company. R right now in the United States and North America, the film has gone from theatrically released to streaming on digital platforms like iTunes and, and uh, YouTube and Amazon. And we're having our... Oh, uh, should I post? She was taking a picture of it. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, and it's kind of have its what's called its um, uh, it, its subscription video uh, streaming is going to be on Hulu actually starting on Friday. Now I don't actually know if Hulu is going to reach uh, Australia, but we do have a wonderful company that is selling the film uh, to the international TV market. So I hope it will be coming. It will be coming soon, and then you can re make requests for individual screenings uh, through our website. Great. Well, we're going to do a vote in just a moment, but I'd first like a round of applause for both our speakers and Scott, the director, Tony and Scott. Thank you, everybody, and I'd like to invite back to the stage our host, Dr. Marina Trigueros of GMO Only, to conclude the event and take your vote. So, hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for, I hope you have enjoyed the movie, and I hope we have changed some of the minds. And I would like to say thank you to Adrian and to all of our panelists that have been here answering all your questions. So, take again your papers and yes or no to GM. Food. Okay, uh, that's right. really good. I need a picture of that. <laughs> yes, or is yes? <laughs> yes, in uh, green, red, uh, games, and yellow undecided. And you can take all of them <laughs> if you want. So, yes, a lot of greens. That's really, really good. Thank yes. you. And thank you, thank you, Scott, for being there awake. It has oh. been nice to see the sunrise <laughs> over there.